Welcome to the ICU podcast, where we explore the vestibular experience through conversations between patients and the health professionals who care for them. During this podcast, we invite patients to share their stories and healthcare professionals to ask questions so they are equipped to better care for and truly see the invisible challenges faced by their patients. I'm Kimberly Warner. And I'm Cynthia Ryan. And we are your hosts on this journey of discovery. Audiological testing can be an important step in helping doctors determine whether the inner ear is the source of patient's dizziness. However, if you've ever talked with someone who has been through the gamut of tests, it's not exactly a picnic in the park. Many patients already ill from symptoms and fearful of tests that can exacerbate them are anxious about their first audiologic appointment. In this episode, we discuss these challenges, how audiologists can help mitigate patient anxiety and nurture an easier and more vestibular friendly experience. I'm excited to introduce our first guest today, Karen Mizrock. In 2017, Karen woke up in the middle of the night with vertigo. After many doctor visits, tests, and treatments, the dizziness and off-balance sensations continued. Finally, she saw a neurologist who recognized her symptoms as vestibular migraine and cervicogenic dizziness. And this year, PPPD was added to that list. The most challenging part of her has been the isolation. Living alone and having to quit her job made this challenge all the more difficult. Finding Vita and becoming a volunteer was a game changer because she now feels connected to people who understand and are supported. Welcome to the show, Karen. Hi, thank you very much. Thanks, Kimberly. And I'm excited to introduce our next guest, Jesus Gomez, who is an audiologist and a first year PhD student in the Vestibular Science Lab at James Madison University. He received his doctorate in audiology from the University of Tennessee, and his interests include electrophysiology, which sounds amazing and crazy to me, and vestibular science. His overarching goal is to become a bilingual clinician scientist, serving both the Spanish and English speaking populations, which I think is also amazing. Um, and if others have not checked it out, Vita um, it just launched a, another video series uh, for Spanish speaking patients um, on vestibular um, topics. So we'll, we'll put that in the comments. Welcome, Jesus and Karen. Thank you. Thank you for having me as well. So this is a really exciting, interesting, provocative, difficult topic. Um, let's start, Karen, with you, because I want to sort of lay the foundation <laughs> for what vestibular testing actually is. So let's begin with um, how did you feel about going into vestibular testing before your appointment? Um, like, did your doctor prepare you for the experience? And if so, what did he or she say? Uh, well, it was a really difficult time for me. Um, I was not functioning very well. I was having trouble moving around my house, um, never mind going to the doctor and trying to deal with all that. So I, I would say I was actually very enthusiastic about the testing the concept of it because I really wanted some answers. And so I uh, dug deep and <laughs> got to the doctor. Um, and the doc, the, I first went to a balance clinic that was an ENT office. And um, he did not really explain to me about the testing other than to say I needed to schedule it. There were uh, several tests and I should plan to be there about two hours. I would have to say I was not nervous about the tests because I really didn't know what they were. 
um, I was really anxious about getting there and waiting in the waiting room. <laughs> I mean, really things that I had never even thought about before became very difficult just to walk down the hallway following somebody to the testing room is, you know, it's still a challenge now, but in the beginning, I really almost couldn't make it. Uh, so that was, that was the hardest part for me in the beginning was just navigating my way to appointments and through the offices. Wow, I'm nodding my head because I remember the navigation is yeah. so hard. So I'm, so, I really appreciate so, you bringing that up. It's so scary. interesting. To me. Yeah, it's so interesting to me that this starts even before the testing. You right. know, the testing was a relief. I I always and to this day when I go to the doctor, once I'm in the room and I'm with the nurse or the doctor or an audiologist, I feel, I'm, I feel safe. <laughs> like if something happens, um, I'm okay. It's yes, it's really just sort of the logistics of getting my body to get there and work correctly. Yeah. Interesting. So Jesus, I, 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 I know that, um, we taught, we from a, a, in the vestibular community, we talk a lot about um, vestibular testing and um, the anxiety that often goes along with um, it from a patient's point of view. Are or were you um, aware that people experience high levels of anxiety prior to vestibular testing? Is that something that they talk to you about when you are uh, in school? Yeah, um, so one of the, I'd say a lot of times when we take care of patients, um, something that we always, or that was really stressed in my program um, at the University of Tennessee uh, was really how much we need to put emphasis on patient counseling. Um, a lot of times what happens is, um, Karen, I'm not really sure how long it actually took you to get vestibular testing, um, but a lot of times the wait for um, getting vestibular testing is very long. Yeah. Um, do you mind me asking how long it was for you? Uh, initially, at the ENT end of things, I would say it took about a month to get the appointment uh, for those first tests. But that was really just the beginning because they came up with normal, you know, there was nothing there. So I had to do further testing and further appointments. And some of them I didn't get in for a year. So, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, there's there's such a need for vestibular testing. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, I've heard statistics that it usually takes about almost three three to four months to get scheduled um, for a vestibular test battery is what we'd like to consider, um, and that is a very long time, uh, especially when you have those initial episodes that can be so severe and, and so debilitating. Um, so um, I kind of have that thought in the back of my head, just knowing, you know, this patient uh, has traveled a long ways to see me um, and they have really just, you know, been suffering with this uh, situation for a very long time. Um, so something that's always really been stressed to me is, you know, when we go and get patients, the, the appointment starts as soon as I get the patient. Um, so it's not necessarily like when I am, uh, you know, taking their case history or something like that in the in the room but i like to get to know them from the very beginning and um, just say you know how's your day been going um did you find us okay um i really feel like this really helps us to kind of get on the, on the patient's level and establish a good rapport with them uh, which i think is so crucial um, because a lot of times there's so much anxiety going into this um, there's so many unknowns uh, we they don't know what's going on with their bodies um, and uh, you know what can happen is, is that these patients, you know, I'm um, just one stop and then all the different kinds of tests that they have to do. They, they're they going to see either cardiology, neurology, uh, ENT. Um, and when they come to see me, you know, it's, it can be a, a, a long wait. So that's kind of how I usually like to start my appointments with that kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. 
That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I actually, um, I was in a, um, I had a medical procedure not too long ago. And I remember that specifically that the doctor, you know, could have been a stressful situation for me. And the doctor was talking to me and distracting me and asking me, you know, we got into talking about hiking and other things, you know, and, and that was helpful for me to um, Mm -hmm. focus on something else. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, dizziness is something really hard to explain. Um, There are so many ways to describe dizziness. um, And sometimes in order for a patient to really give me a good description of what they're saying, they have to feel comfortable. And in order for them to feel comfortable, I really want them to know that this is a team effort, that, um, you know, I'm here to help them. And what they tell me is going to help me help them as well. So we're going to be working together so that we're able to find, you know, if this is vestibular related or inner ear related, um, that we will find some answers for her. Um, you know, and sometimes it's it's not inner ear related. It's not vestibular, um, but we know kind of the steps that we need to take um, in order to continue. I, lo- I appreciate that you say it's hard to describe dizziness and the symptoms because it really, you know, I'm familiar with how it feels, but trying to communicate that to somebody else is really difficult. And it's wonderful that you are aware of that and that maybe you could even offer, you know, different words to use and descriptions. And that's very helpful. Yeah, um, when we uh, we talk about dizziness, like you're saying, it's so hard to describe. So I'll I'll say, you know, is is the room spinning? You know, do you feel like you know you're? Do you feel like that the world is moving? Do you feel like you're veering to one side versus the other? Um, there's just so many adjectives that we can use, um, and that a lot of times when patients are so stressed, it's hard for them to just say, you know, I'm dizzy or I don't feel good. Um, so that's why it's, it's so crucial for us to really understand the anxiety and the stressors that are that they are facing when they see us. Karen, you mentioned that you know a lot of the anxiety for you is um, you know navigating to the appointment. Tell me a little bit about your experience when you actually began the vestibular testing, and it sounds like you had a couple different rounds of that. So, um, yes. yeah, let me know let us know what that was like for you. Um, and also what were the results? Well, the, the first round of testing, like I said, was done at an ENT clinic, a balance clinic, and they did, uh, hearing testing and they did a VNG test, uh, which is very, uncomfortable, you know, where they're putting warm water in your ears and sort of tracking your eye movements and different things. Um, And that was, it was interesting. Um, I did okay with it. I, um, the symptoms that it provoked did go away pretty quickly. And the results were normal. So my hearing they said for your age is normal and the VNG did not show any funny eye movements or anything. I had a brain stem potential test, which I think is an audiology test also. I did not understand that at all, but they told me the name of it and I just went with it. Um, so all those tests came back normal. And one thing I will say is, I found it very disconcerting that when, when being told the results, they always said, good news, (laughs) everything's great. (laughs) And to me, it was not good news. I I felt like, what? That's not great. I want to know what's wrong? You know, I wanted it to show something. Um, So, but those tests were normal. And then I also did testing uh, with a physical therapist, a vestibular therapist who did a lot of different, I did a posturography test in a booth 
and they can make the walls move and the floor moves and, uh, it, you know, it really just throws your system sort of into chaos to see how you respond to different things. And that was interesting. Um, that did show vestibular dysfunction. So that, um, that was a little bit more helpful. Uh, but then I also ended up in a neurology office and they did MRIs. <laughs> so it seems like every, every different kind of provider I would go to had a whole set of testing and the MRIs came back normal. Um, so yeah, it's, it was an ongoing process probably for two years of, and I ended up the audiology testing. Um, I've done a couple of times. So the VNG and the hearing tests. Was there a period of recovery for you afterwards? It doesn't sound, as you're describing it, it doesn't sound to me that you had a lot of anxiety in those tests or. Uh, in the physical therapy testing, uh, it did take me a while to recover. I, it really throw through my system um, into some symptoms that didn't resolve quickly, but I was able to go home. You know, I sat there a while and rested and I was able to get myself home. So yeah. I'm sure it's very, uh, Jesus, you can probably tell us about this with your experience. It's different for everyone. And some people have um, a more dramatic reaction either because their physical, um, uh, their physical problems are uh, more dramatic or, you know, they might simply be more prone to feeling anxiety. Um, and I, I know my mother has Meniere's disease and, and there have been times when she has been uh, in the office and uh, couldn't, couldn't leave for hours because she, you know, she was just there was something that was done that that caused her to spin. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious. Karen was talking about how you had some tests at an audiologist's office, some at an ENT's, some at a physical therapist, some at a neurologist. Obviously, you know, I always think of vestibular testing being done by an audiologist, but it seems like every, as with every part of vestibular care, it's a multidisciplinary team act. Jesus, can you talk about how you work with the other healthcare providers in the on the patient's team um, to uh, to to collect the information from the tests and to interpret the results and share that with the patient? How does that how does that communication work? Yeah, so um, typically what will happen is um, in order for a vestibular patient to be seen, we get a referral from someone. Uh, typically, it's their primary care physician. Um, so they are the main point of contact. Um, so what will happen is we will complete our testing that we do. We will let their patient know our impressions, kind of uh, what we have found today, if we didn't find anything. Um, and then we relay the information uh, back to the primary care physician um, or other providers that are um, or about to be like coming up next uh, on their journey. Um, so if they're going to see neurology, uh, perhaps we'll make the um, the the note uh, visible to them um, and that way everyone kind of stays in the loop um, as to kind of what is to happen so can can i ask who's i don't want to use the term responsibility but whose role is it to um to help the patient understand the the test results and what that means for their care yeah, well, um, for me, like when it comes to vestibular testing, like I feel like it's my job for them to help help them understand kind of what we did today. Um, so the way that I like to set up my appointments is like, you know, initially I'll, I'll ask them, you know, do you know the purpose of today's test um, and kind of what is what is our main goal today? Um, I usually always almost always tell them, you know, today we're going to either rule in or rule out um, if your if your symptoms of dizziness are due to an inner ear problem. Um, you know, so that way they kind of have the expectation kind of set up. Okay, you know, maybe I am not going to get uh, full answers as to why my dizziness has happened, but 
I will know by the end of the day if it's inner ear related or vestibular related. Um, so as we progress through the testing, um, I like to always, you know, we're in there for a really long time. Two to three hours is, is a very long appointment. Um, and a lot of doctor's visits, you know, aren't that long. <laughs> uh, you're usually you're in and you're out. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to really, you know, nurture that relationship with your patient and really get to know them during this time. And kind of this is where I'm, I'm kind of gauging kind of how much the patient really wants to know about what is going on. You know, some patients are very comfortable with us saying, you know, the results today indicated that, you know, it's not a vestibular problem or it is. Um, but some of them really want to know into the pathophysiology of it, like, you know, what is going on inside. Um, so that's kind of ways that I like to gauge them. And um, as we go through the testing, um, I'll, I'll explain my test. And then at the very end, I'll kind of circle back around and say, you know, the goal of today's appointment was to, you know, rule in or rule out our inner ear. Um, and this is kind of what we found today. Um, and from that point, um, you know, I let them know that these are my recommendations and I'm going to be sending them off to uh, the primary care physician or whoever referred them uh, to me um, and that they can always contact me if they have any questions. So. I hey, think so your, your approach is so much better than good news. You don't have a vestibular problem. <laughs> Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, tying in with that, I, I love how you talk about maybe ruling out things um, rather than saying everything's normal. Uh, it's, I think that would have been so helpful for me if um, I had understood that we're not just looking for the problem. We may just be able to rule out a few problems. Um, and I did not really understand that going in. I thought, you know, we were going to find <laughs> the answer. So um, I like that you said you're going to talk to them about ruling out things too. Mm -hmm. That That is important. Karen, yeah, so I had the same thing happen. I, I had the same. I went through two different days of audiological testing and I got the yeah. good news. Everything's <laughs> great. You passed yeah. all the test of flying colors. Right. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's very disheartening after you've been struggling for so long. Yeah, um, I, I think it is a big role for all healthcare providers to set expectations for um, for their patients because we see healthcare providers uh, as this you know this paragon of knowledge and they're supposed to we go to them and they give us the answers and sometimes yeah. they don't have all the answers and 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 it is so specialized you know Jesus does one thing so he's not going to be able to give you all the answers he's going to be able to give you certain answers yes. and then but setting those expectations and educating like you do Jesus you know I'm going to do this and then I'm going to pass you on to this other you know, then you're going to go back to your primary care and they're going to do this. And I had one other um, thought, uh, and Karen, maybe you can share your experience with this, you know, in the, especially in the acute phases um, of vestibular problems, oftentimes um, patients experience some, uh, some cognitive slowness, some cognitive difficulty, problems thinking and concentrating. And I have to imagine that that affects your ability to even hear and interpret what a healthcare professional is telling you. Did you, did you have that experience, Karen? Uh, yes, I would assume that I did. Um, I felt like I was trying to concentrate and focus, you know, and listen, but you're right. There is so much going on. And like I said, I was worried about how I was going to walk to my car. So, Yes, I think there is that feeling that I can't really take all this in. Um, it is hard to keep track. Uh, and when you end up having so many tests done and so many healthcare providers, you do, um, there is some trouble, I would say, keeping track of who said what and what it meant. And I would end up coming home and researching a lot, you know, just based on the few words I took away from the appointment, I would come home and, and look at it. And that, I mean, 
When I am on my own, and I went to most of these appointments on my own, but I think that if patients do have an opportunity to bring somebody, that might be helpful to take notes or just be a second set of ears and eyes to um, interpret. Yes, I have heard that as well. Hey, yeah. Jesus, is that, do you have that happen often during the whole audiological testing process? Do you have family members uh, coming with the patient? Yeah, um, a lot of times that, that is the case. Um, and there is some fogginess to kind of, you know, what um, their symptoms were because it has been a while or, you know, maybe they are in the acute phase and they are experiencing those symptoms. Um, so that could be a, a factor. And we have those thoughts in the back of our head. Um, there's specific test results as we go and we're also analyzing. Um, and I, I think it's also, you know, uh, Karen, what you said about, you know, we give you so much information, but then you had to go and do some research at home. Um, and I think that can happen so many times because, you know, we're talking about some really complex things and then we just give you all that information back. Um, so something that I learned um, when I was at the Cleveland Clinic uh, where I completed my externship, um, I was under the direction of Dr. Julie Honecker. And uh, what she really uh, stressed to me was that, you know, we need to give something for the patients to take home. Um, so she would give them uh, these, uh, you know, her recommendations and uh, kind of, you know, what were the next steps? And I just found that to be uh, so valuable uh, because, you know, it's true. We give you so much information by the time you get home, um, you know, there's, it's hard to remember everything and it's good to, for you to have, you know, something in writing, you know, this is kind of what we found today, our interpretations, this is the next step where you need to go. Yes. Yes. That's, that's a huge help. And I love that idea of writing something down to take home so that, you know, once you've sort of recovered and can think about it, you've got that information. That's great. And I think that's one of the roles that Vita plays in the in this process um, is uh, with our educational resources, helping patients understand. Hopefully, before they go in for testing, but if not, you know, I, I many of our professional members uh, hand out Vita's articles to their patients and say that they're and be and part of it is that their patient they're they're um, uh, they're easy to understand. You know, it's not a lot of medical jargon um, and uh, just just that understanding what just went, just what happened can really reduce your anxiety a lot. Um, and uh, and Karen, it, I, I, I think it is also really important to point out how different it is uh, if you have a support network. Um, both to go to your appointments with you and to to evaluate the information when you get back. Um, you know, I my my brother just uh, was in a, an auto accident, had a, has a vestibular concussion, and uh, we are all the whole family is on an email. You know, checking he's checking in with me because of the vestibular part. My sister because she's a physical therapist, and we're all helping him understand mm -hmm. the results of his his tests because the information he's being given is is really complicated. Right. Karen, you've had a long journey since 2017. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of looking at the, the whole trajectory of your journey here. And the, you know, we're, we're focusing on vestibular testing today. How, in your opinion, valuable was that testing for you personally? Because um, I know it sounds like a lot of them didn't really um, offer any results for you, but I'm curious in your opinion, what, what that um, felt like for you and, and what do you feel the value of those were? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think at the time I did not see the value. I felt very frustrated that I was spending so much time and energy and effort uh, getting to these appointments, and I really wasn't getting any answers. But at this point, I'm glad that I did them um, because I. one thing I would say to patients is you really don't need to keep repeating these tests. And so now that I have done those, I'm done with that. 
And I am glad that I did that and I ruled out some of those things so that I could focus on uh, the neurologic aspects of what's going on with me. Um, so I, I didn't feel it was valuable at the time because there were no concrete answers. But now that I've learned more about it, I feel that it is important to get some of those tests initially. Uh, the physical therapy tests, I did think were helpful, but I think that maybe had more to do with the fact that the physical therapist was very supportive. And that was when I first got clued in that there were a lot of people that had problems like this. I thought I was the only one. Um, and I had never heard of this. And the physical therapist was the first person that really talked to me about um, how this does happen often and there are things that can be done. And I felt that the testing did give me a little bit of information on how to proceed. So. And really also I would add that it's important and I did not learn this right away, but it's important to get your test results on paper, I think. Uh, take them home, keep track of what test you've had, when you had it, what the results were, because with these conditions, you may end up going to several different providers and if you can show them you've had some of these tests, you don't have to repeat them again. And so I do have a folder that if I'm going to a new doctor, I will take with it. So I don't need to repeat all these all the time. Cynthia, I think you're muted. <laughs> Yes, indeed. I my it's cat your mouth is moving, moving in the background. I'm trying, I'm trying to keep you guys from having to listen to my cat. Uh, so um, I was I was just saying they're not fun the first time. So why do them again? Yeah. Jesus, can you think of? Can you share with us maybe um, the story of a patient that was having a particularly difficult time um, when they came to you um, and maybe had one of the the longer uh, batteries of tests um, and what you were, you know, how, how did you help them through that process? And, and what do you think the outcome, what, what was the outcome? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, something that really uh, comes to my mind is um, I had a patient who uh, just had a lot of anxiety coming in. Um, they had they had a lot of other things going on with them, but in particular, the, their dizziness was so debilitating for them. Uh, they actually uh, wanted to come in uh, to see me on a wheelchair. Um, so that's kind of how we started their appointment. Um, and they expressed to me how, you know, she's heard about that water test that, that you were talking about, Karen, of that water going in your ear. Um, and she was like, I, I'm i really nervous about that. Um, I, I want to do it because I want to have an answer today. Um, but in order, like, but, you know, just, just walk me through it. So uh, what ended up happening was, um, you know, I explained to her kind of first what our test was going to do, like, you know, what, what the point of this was. Um, and then just went through the, like, you know, where this, this test is called a caloric, you know, we're going to be putting warm and cold water in um, and really just, you know, kind of helping her to kind of know what is to come. Um, I don't like to use words like, you know, for example, this is going to make you really dizzy. I don't like saying that, um, but I will tell them, you know, this test might give you a sensation of motion or something like that. It might make you feel like you're floating. Um, and with that in mind, the patient is kind of able to prepare kind of what is to come. Um, but then at the end, I always tell them, or before we start the caloric, I will say, um, you know, I want you to know that, you know, this test is important and that we do need to get the, these results. However, you are in control of this. Um, that, you know, if you choose to, we can stop this test and we don't have to do it. Um, but, you know, we, it will give us some information that maybe another test wouldn't. Um, so uh, as we began kind of, you know, you know, I 
closed up those goggles. Um, I, you know, gave her a little countdown and, um, you know, uh, you know, I put the water in and you were, if, Karen, you probably remember that water was really warm at first, probably. Right. Yes. Um, so she was, uh, you know, she's like, Oh my gosh, it's so warm. It's so hot. And I was like, do you want to stop? And she was like, no, let's keep going. <laughs> um, and you know, throughout the testing something that we have to do is just keep the patient's mind active. So what we do for our testing is, you know, we'll ask them a series of questions. And at the beginning of the test, you know, I kind of was gauging kind of what she was interested in and like what her situation was. So I remember asking about, um, her dog. She had this uh, 17 year old, I think it was like a, like a schnauzer or something like that. And it made her so happy um, that she really just wanted to talk about her dog. Um, so that's kind of what we chose as she was waiting. Um, she told me so many tricks that her dog would do. Um, and then, you know, Karen, you probably remember there is a point where, you know, there's a peak where you're feeling like the most, like, you know, the floating sensation. And then you essentially eventually come back down and you kind of stabilize. Um, so as she was telling me, um, we were able to get some good results and, uh, you know, she was still very happy about you know, being able to tell you about her dog. And she was like, you know, other than like that initial warm feeling of the water, like, you know, it was okay. And that's kind of how we went on when we did the other ear, um, just because, you know, I think it's really important to really get to know your patient um, and that will help really calm them down. And, you know, what we were able to find was, you know, there was a vestibular event that happened that you know, really she needs to go move on for physical therapy. Um, and I was able to get some really good results uh, with that test that I did. And then, then I explained that to her. So yeah, wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Jesus, you were saying uh, in your, in the beginning that mm -hmm. um, your goal is to be a, a multilingual clinician. Do you have many um, Spanish speaking patients? Yeah, so um, while I when I was in Cleveland, um, I was able to see a lot of patients uh, who spoke Spanish, and it was it was just so it was very nice to be able to speak in my in my native tongue because um, I Spanish is my first language, um, and a lot of times what happens is when we use translators, there's a lot that can get uh, you know missed. Um, so I really like to do that, and um, I feel like you know not only is it stressful to be dizzy, uh, but then you're waiting a long time. And then on top of that, you add the language barrier. Um, I feel like it's that can be cause a lot of extra anxiety. So I really, uh, really just want to be able to do that to help my patients out. And I think a lot of them do appreciate that I'm able to speak Spanish to them and kind of gives them a little bit more of a, a, a sense that, you know, I understand where they're coming from and what they're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. Um, it's one of the things that Rita recently added to our vestibular healthcare provider directory is language so that um, clinicians can can indicate which languages they speak, because I think that it does matter, make a big difference to a lot of patients to see a clinician who um, they can speak to, even if they do speak um, English as a secondary language, it's still helpful to to have a provider that they can speak to in their uh, native language. Hey, Sus, Absolutely. what a compassionate, thorough, knowledgeable physician you are. I just want to applaud what you're doing. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like you've thought through every step of the process. Um, thank you. <laughs> From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Karen, yeah. is there anything that, in addition to what Jesus has already provided um, and what he offers to his patients, is there anything else that you wish uh, healthcare providers knew or wish that they did to help make this testing process a little bit easier? Um, I guess the, the best thing really like Jesus is saying is just to show that compassion for how difficult this process is and what we go through to find some answers. So, you know, I, I always appreciate it when even if the person that I'm seeing doesn't have anything to offer me or didn't find anything in the testing, if they understand that it's been frustrating and discouraging, you know, just to express that and also 
to um, give direction where to go next and what to do, not just to throw your hands up and say, I, I don't know what to do. I'm sorry. Good luck. You know, I've had people say that just good luck. And maybe um, even just something small, just a suggestion of what to do next really feels hopeful. And it feels like, you know, you have some power. Yeah. So, Necessary. Yeah. yeah, definitely empowering. So Jesus, I, I'm, I'm curious, um, it, do you know if there is any, um, you know, advances in vestibular um, testing technology that is geared toward making the experience more patient friendly or uh, technology or, or otherwise processes? Yeah, um, well, th there's a wide range of um, advances that are currently occurring in the field, but we also, you know, just have to know that, you know, vestibular science in itself is a very young field. Um, there are still so many things that we are learning about the system. Um, you know, something like that we can do is, you know, we are able to, you know, direct patients to where they can see um, some YouTube videos, for example, that will help them uh, with their physical therapy. Um, I'm aware of a lot of more things in terms of the rehabilitative side um, that, you know, there's uh, virtual reality that's being uh, taken into account that, to help the patients um, work through getting uh, back into establishing a sense of normalcy uh, from the comfort of their own home. Because uh, as Karen was saying, you know, it's it's a journey to getting up there, you know. A lot of these vestibular centers are kind of spread out. Um, you're lucky a lot of times if there's one like within an hour of you. Um, when I was in Cleveland, I had people travel five, six hours just to see me. Um, so um, just innovations like that. Um, and there's still so much that it's, the field is still growing. You're absolutely right. There is, <laughs> there is still so much to do with, uh, with vestibular research um, and a lot that is going on. I thank you for that. Is there, um, is, what would you say is your biggest takeaway from today? Um, I just, uh, I really appreciate, um, Karen, just your, your, your side, your perspective of things, because um, I really think it's so needed uh, for other providers to really hear kind of how the patient is, is feeling, um, you know, that, you know, it's, it's really not okay to say everything's normal, um, because the, the patient knows that, you know, maybe my results were normal today, um, but I don't feel normal. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to help you regain some normalcy to your life. Um, and I, I just really appreciate that so much. Um, and I think this will help educate other providers that, you know, that we have to take into account the, the patient as a whole, kind of what is going on uh, in their in their daily life that they're, they're missing out on, um, that they want to regain. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we're aware of that. That is a perfect way to wrap this up, that it's, you know, we're looking at this, um, we, we're looking at this from a, a holistic perspective. You know, each patient is a person first and what's going on in their life um, and how they are being um, impacted by this is going to, to differ. Um, when one, one clinician, uh, Bridget Wallace, likes to say, when you've seen one vestibular patient, you've seen one vestibular patient. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's, that's so good. Perfect. That is perfect. Yeah. Karen and Jesus, thank you so much for sharing your, your passion, your stories, your pain, with us today, I am, um, you know, my take home from this is just the, the absolute importance of laying down clear communication for these tests from the very beginning. What are the expectations and letting that patient know um, every step of the way you, Jesus, hold their hand every step of the way. And I, I think that's um, essential. So thank you. And Karen, thank you for sharing, burying your soul with us a little bit and telling us how hard this experience can be. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you both. Jesus, we're going to see if we can clone you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. You're so nice. <laughs> thank Thanks you so everybody. much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, it was great being able to speak with you all. And thank you for sharing your experience, Karen. I, I really enjoyed it.
And thanks to the, the whole vestibular community for, um, for being there to, um, to listen and, uh, and support us. Um, and for additional questions, um, please visit vestibular.org to find out more about vestibular testing and find um, a vestibular healthcare provider near you. All right. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks for tuning in to ICU this month. We hope this conversation sparked new understanding of the vestibular journey. And for all of our patients out there, leaves you feeling just a little more heard and a little more seen. I see you. Thank you.